Um, welcome everyone, for everyone who's just arrived. My name is Aaron. I'm an ophthalmology trainee currently at the Western Eye Hospital in West London. And today um, I'm talking about visual loss. Um, so, there we go. So this is what we're gonna be covering today. Uh, we're gonna cover kind of pathophysiology, clinical presentation, investigations management of really the key ophthalmological diseases needed for medical school. Um, so not things like conjunctivitis, which hopefully we can cover that briefly at the end, but it's something that unlikely to come up in your MCQs, more of the kind of really key stuff that could come up as a presentation in kind of a case vignette. We're going to classify a visual loss and you'll see how we do that. And it's all going to be really high yield for SBAs mainly um, and a little bit for kind of any OSCE prep that you get. Um, it's going to be about 60 minutes. And as always, with all these lectures that Biomedicine run, all the slides will be available to you guys in a lot as also with the recordings. I'm sorry about that. So um, just quickly uh, talking about kind of the free the resources that kind of Biomedicine offer. Online, if you go kind of check out their website, they've got a full question bank where they really go over MCQs in a way that is really practical for a medical student. And when I was a medical student, not that long ago, we didn't really have anything like this. It's different. It makes you not only understand, it makes you not only kind of clear, concise explanations, but it really goes over a case kind of, as you can see here, what is the first kind of steps, how a patient presents, how do you investigate them? How do you diagnose? How do you manage? Things like that that not only make you feel like you know the condition, but also you feel confident kind of teaching it to someone else or explaining it. And that's when you really know you understand it. So really give it a go. I fully recommend it. Um, they've also got their online textbook where they're really concise. They've got really the high yield points and all the kind of common conditions that could come up. And um, yeah, so that's it uh, before we get started. Um, Great. So, as I said, I really want to take an anatomical approach to today, and I'm, I've not tried this before with any kind of the other ophthalmology medical student lectures that I've done, but I'm going to try it, and I hopefully let me know in the feedback how it works. And really what I want to show you is, this is a schematic diagram of cross-section of the eye, and everyone gets scared of the eye. I was scared of the eye when I started ophthalmology training, but let's just break it down. So, at the front, we have our eyelids, which are not on this picture. And then we have uh, the front of the eye, which is our cornea here. Um, our conjunctiva is basically a clear transparent layer that kind of is over the front of the eye. So it doesn't actually reach the cornea, it actually stops at the limbus, which is kind of where the pupil is, where the iris, sorry. So our cornea is our first real front part of the eye. Um, that's kind of the part in front of the colored part of your eye. Behind that, you've got five layers in the cornea you've basically got this free empty space and that's important this is called the anterior chamber so you see kind of these extensions from the side that's our iris so for example i have dark brown eyes some people have blue eyes this is the colored part of the eye that we see and as you can kind of see when you do kind of a light test your pupil constricts uh, when you shine the light onto the pupil and it dilates when you shine the light away and that mechanism is literally these kind of extensions, which call the iris, kind of pulling away and towards the center. So here, you could call this kind of a constricted pupil. So you can imagine that there's light shining on. And if we take the light away, this ciliary body basically contracts and it pulls this iris away. So rather than having a small round pupil, you get a large one, because this is pulled away to here, and this is called pulled away to here. So think of the cornea, Anything in front of the iris is called the anterior chamber, the front, and anything behind the iris reaching to the back of the lens is called the posterior chamber. So we've got posterior chamber here, pupil, which the size is determined by the iris, and then you've got the anterior chamber and the cornea. So don't worry about the kind of the, the labels for now, I'm just trying to explain it to you. So um, why is the posterior chamber important? Well. The reason why it's important is basically in this little gap here, the ciliary body creates our aqueous. So we have blood flowing through our blood vessels. What kind of provides the nutrients and the oxygen to kind of these parts of the eye, um, for example, the iris and the back of the cornea, the front of the cornea actually doesn't have a blood supply. It gets all the oxygen from the air. So all of this gets supplied by nutrients and oxygen in the aqueous. So that needs to kind of 
rotate, keep going through, just like blood goes through, kind of pumped by a heart. And the, that mechanism is really key to kind of things like glaucoma. So just briefly to understand it, the ciliary body makes what we call aqueous. It pumps it out into the posterior chamber, both sides. The aqueous then flows through this hole, the pupil, into what we just discussed, the anterior chamber. And then it drains through these kind of mechanisms here, which isn't labeled. It's called the trabecular meshwork. Just call it the drainage angle. That's all you need to know. We call it the drainage angle, kind of even in ophthalmology daily life. So we've got cornea, anterior chamber, where we get the drainage. We've got um, the pupil. We've got the iris we've talked about. We've got the ciliary body, which pumps out the aqueous into the posterior chamber. Then we've got this big piece here, which is the lens. And this is literally like a lens in your glasses. So it's a lens that we're born with called a natural crystalline lens. And, um, and it's important because it basically allows us to bend light. It allows us when we're young to kind of see into distances called accommodation. Um, we do that accommodation test during our cranial nerve exams. Um, and as you can see, kind of we've got these kind of zonules these kind of strings, it's these ropes, you can think with the lens in the middle, which kind of changes the shape of that lens. So if I want to focus on my phone here, my lens does that. And then if I want to focus on the screen, it changes shape. And at around 35, 40, you, you probably know parents, older people, they start losing kind of that accommodation. That's called presbyopia, where the lens just can't change shape as easily. So that lens is important. Over time, that lens starts clear and becomes very cloudy very gradually, and that's called a cataract, a pacification of a clear lens. So literally already, in terms of kind of the eye, we've only covered a little bit, but the rest is very, very simple. So this is all what we call vitreous, so jelly, literally a, a jelly that actually has no role in the adult, in a human, basically. It's important when we're in the womb because it helps supply blood to all these kind of parts of the front but once we're born we've got a blood supply already so actually the vitreous jelly does nothing as an adult it's not important that's why in commonly in retina operations we actually remove it all it does nothing um so you've got big jelly which takes up most of the eye and then you've got the retina which is really important it's kind of converts the light into electricity so we can see um and then you can see here just kind of moving past the retina we've got the choroid which is just an extension as you can see here so you've got iris in pink ciliary body in pink and then also this layer which is the choroid and those three things together we'll see today are called the uvea you don't really need to know too much about the choroid remember what i said the iris determines the shape and the size of the pupil the ciliary body pumps out the mechanisms the choroid just knows its extension and then we've got the sclera and this is out just the white part of the eye that we all see the sclera which you just need to know it's a white white part of the eye. And then finally, at the back, we have the optic nerve, which is really important. Um, and we'll see for things like optic neuritis. So that's literally the entire anatomy that you need to know about the eye. The one thing I want to say is the retina is massive. As you can see, all of this is retina. The most important seeing part is called the macula, which is a central part we'll see. And the center of the macula is really important. That's a fovea. So just remember that. So a few questions, okay. If the vitreous is removed, could it still maintain its shape? Yeah, really good question. Yes, it can. So the vitreous literally plays a very minimal role. We can take the vitreous and replace it with oil. We can replace it with gas, but usually that drains out and we take that out over time. So yeah, the, the, the shape of the eye is maintained by the pressure, which is maintained by that aqueous humor at the front. Doesn't the vitreous jelly help maintain pressure? Another question, yeah. So it doesn't actually. So pressure going up and down is purely due to aqueous kind of drainage and aqueous production at the front of the eye. Okay, cool. So I've not done that bit before and how long did it take? It took about six minutes, but hopefully it was useful as we go on. You'll see why the kind of causes of visual loss that we see, which part of the eye they're affecting. Okay. This is a really nice table that um, we've actually made. I made this with Shoei, one of the guys at Bite Medicine, to hopefully summarize, not with too much complexity, kind of an anatomical approach of visual loss and how you can use that in question. So for example, cornea, painful visual loss in cornea is a keratitis, iris, anterior uveitis. So we're going to cover all of these today. Some of them we're going to cover in detail and the others that we aren't, I'm going to briefly cover at the end. So we've selected kind of the key ones that really come up in MCQs. 
Um, and obviously, like I said, all these slides are available. Okay, so as always, we're gonna use kind of a very case-based approach. Um, so have a look at this case. A 26 year old gentleman presents the GP with a red left eye for four days. He describes intense watering and pain of the eye and he is contact lens wearer. So examination visual acuity is 624, the normal is 66. So let me just quickly go over that. 66 is your 2020 vision. So basically six slash a bigger number is, um, is worse. So just to make it out, so six, the front six means you're testing at six meters and the six or the second number says kind of which line you're reading. So if that says six, four, you've actually got better than 2020 vision. So you're seeing the number four line. If you've got 615, you're kind of a bit worse than 66. So you can see 624 is probably a few lines below the normal, which is 66. The conjunctiva appears injected. So the conj is basically this transparent layer. So you can't see it, but as you can see in my eye, for example, you've got the white part of the eye and then the colored bit. So the conjunctiva basically is a transparent layer that basically reaches up to the colored bit, so you can't see it, except when it gets really red and inflamed, and that's called injection. So you can see all this red stuff isn't the white part of the eye, it's actually kind of the conge, the, the clear part. Cornea appears hazy, the cornea we know is this clear window at the front, it's a bit hazy. There's a white collection seen in theory with that straight line, and the pupils are equally reactive to light. So, um, this is the question, if we can switch over to Menti now, um, da, 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 da. this is where I'm just gonna take my time. To, oh no, that's, is that wrong? That's wrong, no, one second, sorry guys. Um, this should be it. Is that right guys? Can you guys see that? If you're not on Menti, then um, uh, make sure you get onto Menti now. It's there, menti.com with the code over there. And let's have a look at the question. So this patient has a microbial keratitis. Which of the following is not a risk factor for this condition? So um, can you guys try and answer that question for me? We've got contact lens wear, trauma, shingles, anterior uveitis, and blepharitis. So I'll give you about 20 more seconds. Try to put down an answer. Which of the following is not a risk factor for microbial keratitis. Don't necessarily think about this case, just think about the condition microbial keratitis. Okay, we'll give about five more seconds. Okay, so stop there. Um, so this is what you guys have gone for. So 43% uh, of you can gone for shingles, 33% for anterior uveitis, 14% for blepharitis, and then a few for contact lens and trauma. So the correct answer here is anterior uveitis. So these are tricky questions and I'm actually not surprised a lot of you have gone for shingles. It can come up, which is why I'm gonna show you why that is not the correct answer. So let's switch back to our slides. There we go. So, as I said, the correct answer is anterior uveitis. So this patient has a microbial keratitis. So let's take this kind of literally how you tackle the question in the exam. This patient has a microbial keratitis. So itis means inflammation, whatever it is. Appendicitis means inflammation of the appendix. Keratitis means inflammation of the cornea. Remember cornea being that clear window in the front of the eye. So microbial means that it's an, um, an infective cause. So micro, a bacteria, virus, a fungus, whatever. So it's an infective cause that's called inflammation of the cornea. Sometimes you get a sterile keratitis where it's not infective. But in this case, we know it's an infective cause of the keratitis. What are the risk factors? So just think about it. If the cornea is that clear window, remember it's not protected by anything apart from kind of the eyelids blinking, but when they're open, it's not protected. Anything kind of bugs wise that gets onto that cornea is going to be a risk factor. And that's what we're trying to eliminate if we're not sure. 
So contact lens wear, we put a contact lens onto our eyes. That is a common source of bugs because you're literally putting something in the eye that stays there for many, many hours. And the most common bug that comes up in MCQs related to contact lens wear is a pseudomonas. So that is a risk factor, which is why we're going to eliminate that. Trauma, once again, if someone punches you in the eye, if a piece of leaf goes and scratches the eye, it breaches the cornea. It provides a path for bugs to get in. Shingles, interesting one. Shingles, remember, is caused by the varicella zoster virus. So that causes chicken pox, and then the, the varicella zoster virus hibernates and is dormant, and it lies in the trigeminal nerve ganglion, which is one of the cranial nerves. And if you remember, uh, the cornea gets sensation from the trigeminal nerve. So for example, can you remember in our cranial nerve examination, for those of you who have covered that, we test the corneal sensation, or we're supposed to ask and say, I would also like to test corneal sensation because the trigeminal nerves, the branches of them actually go and supply the, and the nasociliary branch goes and supplies the, um, the front, the, the cornea for our sensation. So if you've got shingles, you've got the virus kind of reactivated from its dormant stage and it goes to, the, to that, goes by those kind of branches and it can cause kind of a, varicella zoster virus uh, keratitis. So you'd see kind of what we call a pseudodendritic picture. So this is a risk factor, um, remember that. Anterior uveitis. So anterior uveitis, let me just tell you now, itis means inflammation, anterior uvea. Remember the three parts of the uvea, the choroid, the ciliary body and the iris. So the anterior part is the iris. So inflammation of the iris wouldn't necessarily cause a microbial keratitis. There's no infective process here. Remember that. There's no infective process here. Here we know the bugs. Here we're opening a space for bugs to enter. Here there's a virus. This is literally inflammation of the iris. So it wouldn't cause kind of something on the cornea. Last one, blepharitis. Blepharitis means itis, inflammation. Blepharitis, inflammation of kind of our eyelash margin. So where our eyelashes come out of. And what actually happens, and lots of people have this, is we have bacteria that sit on our eyelashes. Some people might wake up and see little crustiness, like kind of like little crusts of yellow kind of uh, on our eye, around our eyelids. And that's basically oil. And that's kind of a nice area for bugs to live. So once again, if we've got kind of bacteria sitting on our eyelashes, that can jump onto the cornea and cause a kind of a blepharokeratitis. So where it starts with a blepharitis and it causes a microbial keratitis. So which of the following is not a risk factor. If we weren't sure, that's fine, but just try and think which one can cause bugs to get in the eye. Actually, all of these four except the uveitis. Does that make sense? Any questions there? Uh, yeah, Prue, exactly. Anterior uveitis is usually autoimmune, great. So now let's cover this case. So microbial keratitis, like I've said, keratitis, inflammation of the cornea. Most of this I've covered. Commonly infective, we've got bacteria such as a staph and a pseudomonas viral such as herpes and fungal such as candida. The risk factors, which was our question, contact lens is the big one. Remember in this particular case, we had um, contact lens where I mentioned over here. So contact lens, imagine putting a contact lens on every day for 12 hours, it's a big risk factor. A breach in the corneal epithelium, which is our trauma. Dry eye, if our tear film isn't very kind of active, our tears kind of, kind of uh, soothe and kind of cover the front surface. If that's reduced, then we've got more kind of chance of bugs to enter. And prolonged use of steroid jobs. Remember, steroids are anti-inflammatory, so they're not gonna protect as much if we do go and get any bacteria that jump on there. Etiology, so the organism, pseudomonas is the most common in contact lens wear. Remember that high yield fact. Also, staphs usually sit on our eyelashes over here. So here, this patient has some blepharitis. You can probably see a little bit here. But more importantly, you can see this big infiltrate, this white patch, which is our corneal ulcer, a keratitis. What are the clinical features for the patient? Painful eye. Remember, the cornea has those nerves that we talked about from the trigeminal nerve. So they kind of cause pain. The eye is red, um, purulent discharge, a greeny discharge, blurred vision. As you can imagine if the light can't get through to that pupil, we can't, that, that person can't see out of it. So it's covering the visual axis, so it causes blurred vision. A hypopia, not in this picture, but in this picture, this is basically a collection of white blood cells and pus. So basically they usually float in the anterior chamber. Remember we talked about the anterior chamber at the start over here. This being our anterior chamber, they usually float 
lots of cells here, but if there's so many, they sink to the bottom. They literally sink to the bottom and form a layer here. And that's what we see at the front called our hypopion. So if we go back to that picture here, that is our hypopion, a level of kind of pus and white blood cells that sink to the bottom. Um, there we are. And a corneal opacity, which is our corneal ulcer, which is that bit of there, that is the keratitis. So how do we investigate this patient? We want to stain it with fluorescein to see it more clearly. Sometimes you don't see that white ulcer. So if you stain, you suddenly see a really obvious defect. And that is basically, think of it like that like a pothole. So basically, if there's a pothole in the road and you put some water in, it will sink and the water will kind of fill that area. And that's how fluorescein works. So you can see that clearly if it wasn't obvious before. And how do we treat it? We do a corneal scrape. So we literally take a needle and we scrape that ulcer. Um, you don't need to know this kind of for your exams, but we literally pick at this and we're trying to get, actually get the edge because that's where the bugs are kind of most um, kind of active. Most of the bugs are there. And we send that for gram stain and cultures on different kind of plates of agar. And then they go to the, go to the lab and they grow organisms. Management, uh, if they're wearing contact lenses, normally we stop that and completely until they're healed. And we give them antibiotic drops. So usually the floxacin, so ofloxacin or moxifloxacin or ciprofloxacin. And then this usually takes two days to come back. Usually if they're not sensitive, we can change the bugs at this point, the, the, the bacteria, uh, the antibiotic drops at this point. Okay, so any questions? How common is microbial keratitis in contact lens wearers? Good question. If you're a contact lens wearer, uh, um, swimming in them, showering in them, sleeping with them, wearing them for more than eight hours a day are the big risk factors. So I've worn contacts for about 10 years and touch wood, never had it, but I see it every single day in eye casualty, every single day. Um, are we supposed to pour the stain into the eyes? No, it's a drop. So literally um, you get a little fluorescein um, drop and you just put it in someone's eye. Um, okay, someone in the chat as well. For the corneal scrape, yeah, patients are given anesthesia, absolutely, yeah, yeah. You, you, honestly, anesthetic drops are amazing. The patient will barely feel anything. Okay, any questions about that? Can I just check, um, are people happy with the pace or is it a bit slow or a bit too fast or people okay with it? Just put, let me know in the chat. Perfect, okay, fine, great. Okay, so move on to the next case. So have a read of this. A 25 year old gentleman comes to eye casualty with a two day history of a red right eye and intense photophobia. When someone says a red right eye, remember what all they're saying is the white part of the eye is no longer white, it's red. That's all it means. On examining, and now you know that that red is actually not necessarily the white part of the eye, it's actually that conge, conjunctiva on top of it that's getting kind of really dilated with the blood vessels and that's why it's red. And intense photophobia, so that just means pain, pain on bright lights. On examination, his left pupil seems distorted in shape. Can you guys see that? It seems distorted, it's not round. He had a similar episode four months ago. So. Let's go back to Menti. Over here. And let's go to the next question. So I've given you the vignette. Have a think, which of the following is the correct first line treatment for this condition? Which of the following is the correct? Which of the following is a first correct line, try again, sorry guys, is a correct first line treatment for this condition? Not completely straightforward because we don't know what the condition is yet. So you've got to think about that first. And if you can't say for sure, try and narrow down the answer to two. Any more answers? 
and we'll stop there. Okay, so this is what people have gone for. So most of you have gone for steroid drops, a lot of you have gone for pressure lowering drops, then a few of you for warm compresses, antibiotics and vitrectomy. So I'm completely happy that most of you have gone for these two because that is correct. The correct answer here is, oh, the correct answer here is steroid drops. I completely understand why lots of you have gone for pressure lowering drops. I would have gone for pressure lowering drops if I hadn't kind of gone through ophthalmology properly. I'm going to explain the key reason why it's not that. Okay, so I'm glad that a lot of you are here to see this. So let's switch back to um, our PowerPoint and then we'll see exactly why, because this comes up every single time with ophthalmology. So the first thing we need to think about is what is the condition here? And that's where we can kind of work out what it is. So we've got a right eye, a young pat man, two day history, and he's got photophobia and his left pupil seems distorted in shape. So, can anyone tell me in the chat what they think the kind of overall diagnosis might be here? And don't worry if you're not sure, just put, try and put something down. Anyone, any ideas? So we've got a few people going for anterior uveitis, anything else? Glaucoma, great. Good. So you're absolutely right. Those are the two kind of differentials here. Um, so the correct answer is steroid drops. I'll go through why. So warm compresses, that would be the treatment for blepharitis. Remember we talked about how blepharitis is that inflammatory process of the eyelashes, the eyelid margin. So if you treat, if you want to treat that, you tell someone to use warm compresses. So think, is this blepharitis? No, can't warm compresses. Let's skip these two for now. Antibiotic drops. I've told you antibiotic drops are things for like that cornea, that microbial keratitis. So this isn't that. Um, there's not a risk factor of, of kind of like contact lens wear. There's nothing to say there's a corneal infiltrate, things like that. And finally, vitrectomy surgery is a treatment for retinal detachment. There's no sign that this is kind of a back of the eye retina problem. Remember, try and take that anatomical approach. There's something wrong with the pupil here, though. So some people think, oh, pupil looks weird. This must be that fixed mid dilated pupil in glaucoma. No. Okay. Really important. No, this isn't. Okay. Um, the reason it's not that is because that fixed mid dilated pupil that you see in glaucoma, which we'll cover today still stays round. So it's just that it doesn't constrict with the light. It stays kind of mid dilated round. This is because rather than being round, there's basically adhesions that have caused it to stick down in certain places. So we'll see why, and that's why it's this weird shape. And this is a clear sign that this is anterior uveitis. So the correct answer here is anterior uveitis. And if I told you that, I'm sure most of you would have gone for steroid drops because a uveitis is an inflammatory process and you treat any inflammation with anti-inflammatories such as steroids. Uh, so could you go over again? Of course, yeah. So in glaucoma, you don't, you see pain, acute angle closure glaucoma, you see pain, reduced vision, red eye. Um, but rather than the left pupil or pupil being distorted like this, it would still be round, but they'll say the left pupil seems mid dilated and not responsive. Okay. So more like say a mid dilated pupil with a hazy cornea. Those are the key signs. This irregular pupil is a sign of uveitis, particularly anterior uveitis. The other big sign of anterior uveitis is this, photophobia. So light sensitivity is always, well not always, but light sensitivity is a strong indication of anterior uveitis. Okay, so we'll cover this now. So remember what we talked about? The uvea is three parts. You've got the iris, which becomes a ciliary muscle in the ciliary body, and then the choroid. So all you need to be aware of is anterior uveitis. It's like 80-90% of uveitis is anterior. So anterior is the front part of the uvea, which is the iris. So it's inflammation of the iris. So it's also called iritis. Be aware of that. They may put that in your MCQs. Iritis is anterior uveitis, because we now understand that anterior uveitis means inflammation of the iris. Okay, it can occur as just a random isolated problem, but usually it's associated with the HLA-B27 uh, genotype, the haplotype, okay, HLA-B27. 
And remember the conditions that are associated with that. Ankylosing spondylitis. What are the features you'd expect in an ankylosing spondylitis? What kind of patient, guys, would you think? Can you remember the features of ankylosing spondylitis? Exactly, a young male with back pain that gets better on exercise and worse with rest. So that's what I was trying to get at here. Think of the age, a young man in his 20s, very common for ankylosing spondylitis. Psoriatic arthritis, they may mention psoriatic plaques. Writer syndrome, the, the triad of can't we, can't see, can't climb a tree. And then inflammatory bowel disease. So be aware of those kind of clues in the question. Clinical features, remember we talked about photophobia being a big one. A red eye and watering are very non-specific signs. That's why you really need to pick out in eyes that key sign. So for example, photophobia is strong indication of an iritis, also known as an anterior uveitis. What are the key signs? This, so an anterior uveitis, remember, is basically where the iris is inflamed. So this part here. And the way this presents in the eye is you get lots of kind of inflammatory processes, cytokine release, and lots of white blood cells come to try and uh, basically fix this. And the way that presents is you've got lots of white blood cells here and they present as your hypopian, as your hypopian. So sometimes you just see kind of cells floating around in the anterior chamber, which is kind of very, very, what we see here, white blood cells floating in the anterior chamber. I don't have a picture of that, but um, you will literally see with a high magnification where that pupil is, lots of little dots, kind of like when you see a projector screen and you know, as you look at the light through the kind of, in, through the kind of room, you see kind of, sort of dust particles. That's a really clear sign that you see in the eye of these cells floating. If there's lots of cells, they settle, as you said, as I said before, to form a hypopian. The other thing is this distorted pupil. So why do you get a distorted pupil? It's due to something called posterior synechiae. Synechiae means adhesions from the iris. Posterior means backwards. So when you've got a really inflamed iris, what happens is it gets really swollen. Remember when it gets inflamed, it gets swollen and it sticks. It forms adhesions to our lens. So it sticks down. So rather than being to open and close with light, it gets stuck down and to the lens. That's why it's posterior, so it's sticking backwards. And you get this distorted pupil because if it's stuck down, it just can't open and close with light. Does that make sense? It's really important to try and understand that. Um, yeah, this picture was from before, but I'm just trying to explain the hypopian. That's why I put that there. Um, does everyone understand why it's kind of a, why you get that irregular pupil now? Because it's stuck down, it can stick down in different places. Yeah, of course, I'll explain it again. So basically, um, with an inflamed iris, it gets really big and chunky and inflamed, and it likes to kind of get sticky, and it sticks down to the front of our lens. This is our lens, this is our iris, they're very close. And if it say sticks down here, this might kind of constrict and dilate with the light. But this bit doesn't always do that. So rather than getting a nice round pupil, you get this bit, which is stuck down. So it's not constricting back. Do you get that? That's why you get a very missed, kind of a really weird shape um, eye in anterior uveitis. It's because of the posterior synechiae. You don't necessarily need to remember that. It's just so you know the, the pathogenesis behind it. Okay, great. Yeah, exactly. So hypopian doesn't necessarily mean a bacterial keratitis. It could mean an anterior uvea. All it means is white blood cells and pus sitting there. Usually it's with a corneal ulcer, you're thinking bacterial keratitis. It could be an anterior uvea. It could be an endophthalmitis. So hypopian alone isn't a sign of this is a diagnosis. Okay, so how do we manage it? This is caused by an anterior uvea. It's an inflammatory process. It's not infective. So we don't use antibiotics, we use steroid drops. So dexamethasone, steroid drops. If there are these posterior synechia, we want to try and break them down. So what you tell the patient is, can you just take these dilating drops every so often, like four or five times a day? I want you to try, I want your pupil to really try and open up and that will hopefully break these adhesions. Because we don't want that pupil to kind of stay stuck down. If it stays stuck down, then it's just gonna get harder and harder those adhesions to break. So the main treatment is the steroid drops to reduce the inflammation. 
and that kind of settles it over time when they get this kind of acute episode. But the cyanechia, I need to kind of break down with dilating drops. And that's why if you look back, I said this patient had a similar episode four months ago. So these kind of B27 HLA patients get uveitis, we treat it, and then after a bit of time, it comes back. Um, it flares up, basically. So usually they've had episodes before. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so, um, great, let's move on. Next case, a 69-year-old woman presents with severe headaches, blurred vision, and a red, painful left eye. She has vomited twice. The left pupil is dilated and oval in shape. The cornea is hazy. So let's switch back to Menti. Uh, oh, sorry. Here we go. So let's go over here. Next question. Okay, so um, what is the most likely diagnosis? Have a look, guys. Anterior uveitis, optic neuritis, acute angle closure glaucoma, giant cell arteritis, and raised ICP. Give you about 30 seconds. So you've got pain, reduced vision, vomited twice, the pupil is dilated. What do you think? Five more seconds. And stop there. So most of you have gone for anti, uh, uh, and, uh, sorry, most of you have got acute angle closure glaucoma. I'm really happy that none of you have gone for anterior uveitis because we've seen that that is photophobia with the mist, mist, uh, with the distorted pupil. This is the correct answer here, guys. Well done, acute angle closure glaucoma, the vomiting, all of that points towards that. So well done, guys. Let's go back to um, side. So you can see most of you should do ophthalmology. It's, it gets straightforward once you understand the anatomy. So um, anterioritis, photophobia, and that posterior cyanica would cause a misshaped pupil. Optic neuritis causes the five signs of optic nerve dysfunction. We'll cover that later, but can anyone tell me them in the, can anyone put them into the chat? There's five signs that you all need to know, which suggests that there's a reduced optic nerve function. Do you guys know them? Yep, good. Ryan, pain on eye movement, ophthalmoplegia. Anything else? RAPD, good. Maram, too. Anything else? So it's reduced vision, reduced color vision, good. Loss of color vision, great. One of them is reduced vision, like visual acuity. Not I know. Um, red desaturation is another kind of visual uh, color vision. And there's a visual field defect. So the visual field kind of changes with the optic nerve. Okay, so reduced visual fields, yeah. I know is a sign of multiple sclerosis normally where you've got eye movements that are distorted. We can talk about it at the end. Red desaturation just means that when you test with color vision, you can test with Ishihara plates or with the color red. The color red is the most sensitive if you don't have the plates. So um, this is the correct answer. Giant cell arteritis is usually a patient who's over 50 with scalp tenderness, temple pain, reduced vision, jaw claudication, shoulder pain, um, and raised ICP, but those postural headaches, visual obscurations, tinnitus, nausea, vomiting, so this is the correct answer here, guys. Well done. So let's talk about glaucoma. What is glaucoma? It's a triad. It's three things. It's optic nerve damage with a visual field defect, and it's related to raised pressure, raised intraocular pressure. And remember, we talked about what determines pressure. What was the one thing that determines pressure? It's not the vitreous. What is it? Anyone remember? What determines the pressure in the eye? Yeah, aqueous, good, exactly. Aqueous humor, aqueous fluid draining. It's made in the ciliary body. It goes in the posterior chamber, pupil, anterior chamber, and drained. So there's kind of, and basically what it is, the reason why people always ask, why is the pressure, is it to the front of the eye, affect the back of the eye, affect the nerve? Basically, when you've got high pressure, everything is compressed and it compresses the optic nerve. That's why you get optic nerve damage. 
that's why you get a visual field defect. Remember, one of the five things of uh, nerve damage is visual field defect. Um, so there's two main types of glaucoma, open angle and closed angle glaucoma. Let's talk about the pathogenesis of first of normal, what normal is. So normal aqueous pathway, as I said before, the aqueous is made in the ciliary body. It's secreted in the posterior chamber. It passes through the pupil, we covered this before, into the anterior chamber. And then, and then basically it drains through this drainage pathway that you don't need to know about, but it drains through here. A small amount drains through another pathway. You don't really need to know that. So just think of it like that. Okay, angle closure glaucoma. That's what this case is about. So what is going on here? So when the pupil kind of dilates, normally the pupil is constricting and dilating with light. Basically what happens is the peripheral iris bunches up. So remember, if you've got less light, so in dark conditions, that pupil opens up. So this iris over here bunches towards, it pulls towards this way. And basically what happens is the peripheral iris bunches up and you get this increased resistance to aqueous flow. So not as much can kind of drain because you can see the angle is kind of quite narrow now. What happens is, is the less drainage, kind of more kind of aqueous starts to build up, build up, build up, builds up towards a posterior chamber and actually pushes this iris forward even more, narrowing that angle, which starts like this and suddenly it's closes, 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 and then it's completely shut. So you get this kind of feedback mechanism where it starts when you go into dark conditions and then it gets worse and worse and then you get really intense pain when you just can't drain it any more fluid. And this is what happens with acute angle closure glaucoma. The risk factors are female patients, small eyes. You can imagine if you've already got small eye, your angle starts off already quite small, so there's not much leeway. Asian ethnicity, usually kind of Chinese, kind of those kind of uh, patients get this a lot and age as you get older. As you get older, basically the mechanisms of drainage aren't as good, so therefore you're more prone. So that's acute angle closure of glaucoma. So at one point, suddenly the angle shuts and then you get this pain, the vomiting, uh, all those signs, which are a pressure, intraocular pressure of more than 40. Normal is usually 12 to 21. So 40 is very high, the eye red, the cornea becomes cloudy. The reason why the cornea becomes cloudy is because suddenly you've got aqueous that isn't draining. It's, it's stopped here. So you just, the new aqueous, which has the oxygen or the nutrients that kind of supplies that posterior cornea. Remember the anterior cornea gets all the oxygen from the air. The posterior cornea gets it from the aqueous. Remember that was the point of the aqueous. If it's not getting all the oxygen and the nutrients, it's going to kind of stop working and it becomes cloudy. So it becomes cloudy. The pupil becomes fixed, oval, and irregularly dilated. So basically, what happens is uh, you get, remember we talked about posterior sinica, where the adhesions in anterior uveitis are kind of here. Here you get these kind of adhesions here. So the anterior iris sticks to the trabecular mesh. If you think it's zipped shut, it kind of stays shut. So that pupil just can't come back and constrict. So it's sinica because it's adhesions from the iris. But this time it's basically these adhesions zip up the angle, the drainage angle at the front. So you don't need to remember they're called peripheral anterior sinica, but you just need to remember that. That's why the pupil can't constrict because it's literally stuck down. Um, it's fixed and it's irregularly dilated. So it's bigger than normal. You get pain, watering and reduced vision. How do you treat it? The first thing you need to do is try and bring down the pressure, okay? And you can use drops for this and they work in different ways. But the most definitive treatment for this is you need to make another kind of drainage pathway. So if you've got kind of this being shut, what we do is we basically make a hole in the iris. So we literally cut the iris here so that drainage can literally seep through here as well. And that's called an iridotomy. So a hole, otomy, and iridotomy is iris. So you can see here, Normal pupil, can you see this hole up here? We usually put it at the top so it's covered by the eyelid normally. So you lift the eyelid, you can see there's a hole. So there's an extra drainage pathway and we usually use it, but we usually make it using a laser machine called a YAG, ND YAG laser. And that's closed angle glaucoma. So um, can you explain why it isn't raised ICP? So raised ICP patients would present more with kind of yet yeah, they'd have nausea, they're vomiting, but they've had an intense headache, which are postural when they move their head. 
they'd have tinnitus, they'd also have visual obscurations where the vision goes blurry. They wouldn't have any pupil signs like a fixed dilated pupil. Um, can, Dion, can you explain a little bit anterior synecia? Of course, yeah. So you don't need to know this. No one's going to ask you this. Probably most medical doctors don't understand this, but I'm trying to show you why is this a fixed oval dilated pupil? It's because it's due to the synecia. So the iris is very good at sticking to things. So when it gets inflamed and isn't happy, it sticks to things. So in uveitis, it's posteriorly sticks to the lens. In glaucoma, because you've got basically the dark conditions, remember that's what stimulates and triggers this, the pupils are quite big, so the iris gets pulled away. And here you've got rubbing of the iris to basically um, the drainage angle, which we call the trabecular mesh work. So these black things are adhesions that form because they stick down the iris. It can't constrict back into a normal round small pupil. It stays fixed and dilated. Okay, so very quickly thought we'd talk about um, why this patient have vomiting. Good question. The reason they have vomiting is because the pressure just gets so high, it causes a reflex that causes them to feel really sick. There's no other reason for it. It's a common thing with glaucoma. Just because we covered acute angle closure glaucoma, I thought we'd quickly build on the other type, which is the open angle glaucoma. So this is not an emergency. This is a very chronic problem. So this is where rather than the angle being kind of zipped closed, it stays open, but the actual drainage pathway, which think of it as small holes where the aqueous drains through, they basically get blocked. So you've got this extra extracellular debris and material that block these spaces. Um, and the risk factors are old age, African, family history is very important, big eyes, so myopic, myopic patients tend to have this more, diabetics, these are all common risk factors. And basically this is completely asymptomatic. So the patient rarely notices this. They don't get sudden bursts of the pressure going really high. The pressure just sits slightly higher at like 24, 25, 26. So just a bit higher. Whereas remember with acute angles like in the 40s, 50s, 60s, over time, that very mildly raised pressure causes compression of our eye and it causes compression of the optic nerve. So you see this, what we call the cup to disc ratio. So this yellow small circle is our cup. This is the disc, the head of the optic nerve. So that ratio of that to that normally should be about 0.4. When you've got compression, the, the nerve at the outside starts to die as it's being compressed from the outside. So you get kind of narrowing of this outer bit what we call the neuroresinal rim, and the cup to disc ratio gets bigger and bigger. And symptom, uh, well, what we test for is the visual fields and slowly they, use, they lose the kind of outer visual fields because they're losing these kind of optic nerve fibers on the edges. Treat this with drops normally, just regular drops to kind of keep that pressure less than 22. And then you can do sur surgeries if drops aren't enough. But this is a very chronic problem. How is the size of the eye measured? Um, I'm not sure what you're asking there. I think you're asking my, I'm not sure what you're asking there. You need, you need, some, need a bit more information. Um, is iridotomy on the normal eye for prophylax? Absolutely, yeah. So with people with acute angle closure glaucoma that get in the right eye, they've probably got a similar kind of anatomy. So then, then sighting, shallow what we call or narrow already on the other eye so we usually do it on both eyes as a prophylactic thing exactly okay great everyone happy so far let's move on to the next question so a 32 year old woman presents to Amy with a six hour history of sudden onset flashes of light and a curtain in her peripheral vision of the right eye you can see this is normal and this is the curtain she hit her head following a fall down the stairs two days prior. So suddenly she's got flashing lights and a curtain in her peripheral vision in the right eye. So let's go back to Menti and see the question. What is the diagnosis you would most worry about? What is the diagnosis that you would most worry about? Vitreous detachment, endophthalmitis, giant cell arteritis, Retinal detachment and cataract. OK. 
Okay, let's have a look at the answers that you have gone for. So 95% of you have gone for retinal attachment, correct answer. 5%, which I'm really happy that 5% have gone for this, have gone for vitreous attachment because they are related, but this is a retinal detachment. And the reason it is, we'll see, is because it says, what would you most worry about? What would you most worry about? Remember we talked about vitreous has no role in the eye, whereas retina is really important. That's why, oh, that's one of the clues as to why it's a retinal detachment here. So let's, oh, oops, sorry, stop sharing accidentally. Uh, let's go back to the slides, great. So, the correct answer is retinal attachment. So vitreous attachment, that would more present what would say floaters, but that could lead to a retinal attachment. So when the vitreous pulls away, detachment it means that basically it's pulling away. So we find a nice picture here, yeah. So a detachment JC means usually it pulls forward. So this big bit here is the retina, but remember we've got the jelly here. So the jelly pulling away is fine because the jelly doesn't play a role. And that usually causes floaters. So floaters are basically um, you sometimes, see, I see them a lot because I'm myopic, so I'm short-sighted, where you kind of see against a white background, a lot of black spots kind of just flying around. Your brain usually fades them out, but for example, if I concentrate, you can see literally the sound of flies kind of just moving around. It's a bit weird if you don't get them. Um, but if the jelly pulls away and it pulls away completely, that's fine. But sometimes it pulls away partially and then the last bit, it pulls the retina with it. And that's why I've said here, it can lead to a retinal detachment. The other clue that this isn't a vitreous detachment is vitreous detachment is normally a common aging process. This is actually after trauma in this case, which is why it's more likely a retinal detachment. Endophthalmitis would present painful eye, reduced vision, hypopion, because lots of infective processes. Usually it's after some sort of surgery that we've done. Giant cell arthritis, we've talked about before, an elderly over 50 Caucasian patient with temporal pain, jaw claudication, polymyalgia, Retinal detachment is the correct answer. This is an ophthalmological emergency. Remember, it says, what would you most worry about, which is another clue. And cataract is a very gradual, over decades, deterioration of your vision. The glare at night being a good kind of other symptom to look out for with cataract, if your MCQ mentions that. So we'll quickly cover retinal detachment. Retinal detachment is the potential space between two parts of the retina. So you've got the neuro retina, uh, which is kind of the nerve related bit which forms the optic nerve. And the, so the nerves, the retina forms nerve fibers that go into the optic nerve that eventually go to the brain. And the RPE, which is the retinal pigment epithelium, they're loosely attached, they become separated, it pulls away, that is your retinal attachment. Risk factors are trauma, um, retinal attachment from the other eye, and if you're a high myop. So someone asked about big eyes and small eyes. So I understand now what you're saying. So myopic patients, there's usually short sighted like me, lots of you will be myopic. They generally have bigger eyes. Um, if you've got bigger eyes, you have lots of stretching, so they're more at risk of retinal tears. That's why they're also more at risk of open angle glaucoma because they're just big eyes. Hypermetropes, which are long-sighted people, which they struggle to read closely, but they can see well in the distance. They've got small eyes, so they've got a narrow angle, so they're more at risk of the acute angle closure of glaucoma, which we talked about. Um, Uh, good question. Uh, is RPE at the side of the vitreous? I mean, which layer is outermost towards the vitreous? Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, so that's done. So how do retinal detachment present? Flashing lights, which is random flashing lights, lots of new floaters, so hundreds, not just a few. A few, like two, three, four, would be a vitreous kind of jelly detachment. Hundreds of floaters would be a retinal detachment. And this is the key one, a shadow or curtain over the vision like we talked about here. So this is literally where you can see the retina pulling away. And you see this diagram here, you can actually see all this retina basically pulling away slowly. So that's why you see that shadow or curtain treatment, send it straight to ophthalmology. We need to do surgery quite urgently. And we do a pars plane of vitrectomy uh, where we kind of reduce, remove the jelly. Um, what are floaters someone's asked? Like I said, they're little black dots that you don't, you, you can't understand until you get them or hopefully you never get them in your vision. They're basically parts of the jelly moving around. The jelly doesn't do anything, but you've got little bits of jelly that sometimes move around in the jelly. Um, so that's what they are anatomically. Okay, so onto the final case of the day. Uh, we've got a few short cases at the end, but this is the final kind of case with a question. So you're doing really well, guys. 
Um, last bit, a 63 year old lady presents to eye casualty with sudden, painless, significant reduction in vision in her left eye. Now, listen, she has a really important, she has a 30 year pack history, um, hypertensive and diabetic. Her visual acuity is really reduced. So 660, remember 66 is normal, 2020 vision. Six means it's tested at six meters. 60 means you can only see the 60 line right, the, the worst line basically. The eye itself is white, so the front of the eye looks great, but the back of the eye, imagine this, but all over basically. Multiple hemorrhages in all four quadrants. So this quadrant, this quadrant, this quadrant, this quadrant, okay? So what is the most likely diagnosis? We'll quickly switch back to Menti. Do, 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 do. Over here, what is the most likely diagnosis? Here we go, guys. We've got endophthalmitis, central retinal artery occlusion, diabetic retinopathy, age-related macular degeneration, and central retinal vein occlusion. So I'll go over the key points. Sudden painless loss of vision, diabetic hypertensive, smoker, and suddenly you've got all four quadrants, basically lots of hemorrhages and um, cotton wool spots. Got five seconds left. Try put down an answer. And stop there. So, oh, we've got a nice split here, actually. So we've got central retinal artery occlusion, diabetic retinopathy, and central retinal vein occlusion. So the correct answer here is central retinal vein occlusion, and we'll go over why. So, okay, so endophthalmitis, none of you went for because we've talked about how that's usually after surgery. So, we're going to talk, stop talking about that. A central retinal artery occlusion. So, this is where you do get sudden vision, it's painless, but the signs would be very different. You get a cherry red spot on the macula with a pale retina. So, rather than the retina being nice and orange normally, it's very pale. And you get a little red dot at the macula, which is that center, complete center. We'll go over that at the end. Got a nice picture of that. Diabetic retinopathy would not be a sudden kind of change. Diabetic retinopathy is basically when someone's diabetic, their vessels just slowly get damaged. So it's slowly decreasing vision, an uncontrolled diabetic. They do get a few hemorrhages. They do get cotton wool spots around the vessels, but it's not a sudden event. Age-related macular degeneration, the, the vignette would say this patient has dry AMD. So dry AMD is the kind of the common type, which most 90% of AMD is dry, but they just get deposits kind of of toxic waste products. When they start to see kind of distortion, that is the big thing here. The vignette will say they see distortion where the kind of what we mean by that is the straight lines and things appear jagged. That's when it becomes wet macular degeneration. And that would be a sudden event, but you don't get all these hemorrhage or something like that. But you would get them with a CRVO, central rational vein occlusion, vascular risk factors, which this patient has, sudden loss of vision, all four quadrants with hemorrhages and cotton wool spots. So that's why this is a CRVO. Some of you went for CRAO, which is the history is correct, but the signs are wrong. So that would be a cherry red spot, a literal red spot on the macula or the favia, I should say, with a pale retina. And then some of you went for AMD, which we can see now, the history would be of, kind of distortion and there wouldn't be all these hemorrhages and things like that. This is due to fluid basically. So you wouldn't see that apart from on a scan. Okay, CRVO, central retinal vein occlusion. What is it? It's occlusion of the central retinal vein, very straightforward. And it's basically a clot in the central retinal vein, like you get a clot anywhere else. So um, you get a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis in the leg. So it's usually related to Verkhoff's triad, which is the stasis, the vessel wall damage, hypercoagulability. So risk factors, older patients, hypertensive, high lipid levels, diabetes, smoker, which this patient had all of them. And as I said, clinical features, sudden unilateral blurred vision, which is painless, but the fundus findings, and this is the big one, you get hemorrhages and cotton wool spots in all four quadrants of the retina. You also get usually dilated, tortuous stains, but that's quite hard to see. A central retinal vein occlusion is where the big central retinal vein gets blocked. That, that branches off into these smaller veins. So for example, this is a vein here. These big ones are usually veins. The bigger ones are veins. The smaller ones are arteries. A branch retinal vein occlusion is this. 
So this is where half of it is usually affected. So you can see here, this is fine, this is fine, it's fine. Here, a branch retinal vein occlusion where the clot isn't in the central retinal vein, it's kind of distally where it's already branched off. So that's why I put this picture here. All four quadrants though means um, it's a central retinal vein. So these are all the hemorrhages and these white spots here, 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 here they are um, cotton wool spots, a little white deposits. Management of this, to be honest, if it's just a central retinal vein occlusion and you diagnose it, you don't need to do anything. This all settles. So allow time to settle, but closely monitor them. Why do we monitor them? Because there's two complications you need to be aware of that come around because of CRVO. One of them is macular edema. So this is where you get kind of fluid building up in the center part. And that is a common complication. You get cysts of fluid and you treat that if you see that with injections in the vitreous. So intravitreal injections of anti-VEGF. So they basically stop the fluid or reduce the fluid. Another complication is retinal neovascularization. So neo means new, and vascularization means vessels. So the new vessels that basically grow in the retina because you've got an ischemic retina. If you've got basically poor blood supply from a blockage, you get ischemia. Ischemia causes VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor to be released. And that causes new vessels. The body is trying to compensate and respond while this is a good idea, it seems like actually these new blood vessels are not like your normal blood vessels. They're very fragile, they can bleed. So we wanna stop them from forming. So what we do is we do laser photocoagulation. So these marks here are laser photocoagulation. So what is the thinking behind this? Basically, the seeing part of the retina is literally this bit within these arcades, the macula. Everything else is completely but it's, this is 95% of the vision, this is all 5%. So what we do is we basically burn marks. We use laser to burn this part of the retina. That patient will barely notice a difference. But if you kill this part of the retina, all the demand for the blood now is going to this. You've reduced the, you've reduced the demand by, by a lot, but the supply is all gonna go here now. So that's why we do it. So we don't want these new blood vessels to form. So if we see new blood vessels, we don't really want them, so we kill off the retina here, so you don't get kind of the drive for the vascular endothelial growth factor. Okay, so those are the five main cases. Can you point out the cotton wool spots? Yep, I've done that now, so great. So why do cotton wool spots go? Great question. It's basically where you get nerve fiber layer of the retina leaking out. So you think about it, you've got a blockage. Um, the retina past the blockage isn't gonna get blood, so therefore it starts to kind of leak out. So that's what it is. Is the retinal detachment not cared for immediately? If the retinal detachment is not cared for immediately, is it hard to treat? Yeah, absolutely. If you get retinal detachment that's bigger rather than smaller, it means the prognosis is worse. So yeah, we wanna try and get them emergency to ophthalmology surgery. Okay, so really good guys. Sorry we rushed the end. I'm happy to take any questions, but I just wanna cover those other big things that we talked about in our table very quickly. So CRAO, Central Retinal Artery Occlusion. It is an ophthalmological emergency because this, this could be a sign of a stroke. So what is the first thing you do if you see a CRA in your MCQ? The first thing would be transfer to a stroke unit. Why? It's an obstruction of an artery in the brain um, rather than the carotid artery or the kind of vertebral artery that causes a stroke. You get this in the eye. So it's a central retinal artery. It causes a lack of blood supply to the retina, which is why we said the two signs were a pale retina and this red spot here. There's three forms of this. You've got amaurosis fugax, where you've probably heard where you get this transient vision loss that lasts for a few seconds and then comes back. That's because the, the plaque or whatever, the blockage blocks the artery and then it passes through. But you get a few seconds. A branch retinal artery occlusion, where like a branch retinal vein, one part of the retina becomes pale. And then a central retinal artery, where the entire retina becomes pale. Um, what is it caused by? The blockage is thrombus or embolic, so kind of a plaque or calcium, or a vasculitis, like a giant cell arteritis, where the retinal vessel walls become inflamed and block the lumen. Sudden painless vision loss. Retina is pale, cherry red spot. So a completely different appearance here to your CRVO, which we've seen before. Management straight to stroke unit, because they need to investigate this. Is there a stroke that they need to break up or thrombolize? Um, with these investigations. Cataract, 
painless opacification of the lens. So remember that lens starts off clear. You can see it's become very cloudy. It's basically over time, chemical and structural alteration of the lens proteins means it goes from clear to opaque. Risk factors are old age, diabetes, steroid use, and light exposure. It's very gradual. So normally you get it in your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and you get glare at night. Another kind of thing that people say is I'm driving, I just can't, these lights from other cars really irritate me. Only thing to do is surgery. So we remove that lens through phaco emulsification surgery, where we basically mush it, break it up, mush it up and suck it up with a phaco machine. Uh, last thing, two more things, orbital cellulitis, another thing, it's an infection um, that spreads past the orbital septum. So, something we didn't cover actually at the start, We've got your eyelid. The eyelid has different layers. In the middle of the eyelid, there's a wall, like you've got a wall in the center of the heart, your heart septum, you've got an orbital wall septum. So if it passes the orbital septum, it's an orbital cellulitis. If it doesn't pass, it's called preceptal cellulitis, pre meaning in front, septal meaning in front of the septum. So what causes this infection? It's usually a direct extension from something else. So for example, sinus problem, a dacrocystitis, which is inflammation of kind of the, um, the lacrimal sac, which is this sac here, or horiolum, which is like a sty, sits on the eyelid, or complication of trauma. Risk factors is actually age. So young patients are more likely to get orbital cellulitis because the orbital septum doesn't form until about the age of seven or eight. So any kind of sinus infection can easily spread into the eyelid through that very thin septum, which hasn't fully developed, and then into the orbit, which we don't want. Organisms are usually staph and strep. And this is a preceptal cellulitis. So this is where you basically just get the first part where the lid gets red and inflamed. But the things in orbital cellulitis that you also get are fever, proptosis, where the eyes push forward, and the red flag signs we talked about where optic nerve is affected, we've talked about these already, reduced vision, reduced color vision, RAPD, reduced visual fields and ophthalmoplegia, so pain on eye movement. So if you get an orbital cellulitis patient, you will investigate with a CT orbit, the CT is the best thing, and then you manage it with broad spectrum IV antibiotics, and then ENT you have to get involved because usually it comes from a sinus, they may need to drain the original source of an infection. Um, and last thing I want to cover is endophthalmitis, which we've covered in a bit in the MCQ answers. It's a serious but rare inflammation of the interior part of the eye. It's usually related to surgery. So you'd see kind of this patient had surgery within the last week or two. One week, like I said, pain, loss of vision, red eye, hypopion, staphs and streps again. And the way we treat this is because it's a big infection within the eye, we take samples from the aqueous, samples from the vitreous and give them antibiotics into the jelly so it's really going to the source so that's endophthalmitis so that's everything covered here so we've done keratitis so we went through that in depth anterior uveitis the two glaucomas we've covered cataract retinal detachment crvo where you get the hemorrhages and cotton wool spots all over crao which is a pale retina with a cherry red spot macular edema and wet AM, macular edema, which is complication of CRVO, a vitreous hemorrhage we didn't quite cover, but basically that's where you get that CRVO complication of retinal new vessels, which are fragile, they can bleed and cause blood in the vitreous. We've covered wet AMD, we've covered optic neuritis, uh, orbital cellulitis and endophthalmitis. So um, this is the references and thanks for joining guys. I know it was a bit rushed at the end, I'm really sorry. But I hope you found it useful. Um, try to jam basically everything in that could come up in your MCQs. Like I said, in an anatomical but case-based approach as well. Um, and I hope you guys found it useful. Um, I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, and yeah, I really hope you found it useful. Thanks, guys. I can see the chat. Um, and um, make sure you fill in the feedback form for me as well. Um, or you can just tell me here, this is a QR code for the feedback. Um, if you guys want it on the chat, I'll do that now as well. Um, sorry, one second, the screen is starting to freeze on me. Um, okay, don't worry. Um, if you can, then great. But otherwise, just tell me in here, be honest, what worked and what didn't. Um, I'm trying to get the feedback form. I just want to know, did that anatomical bit at the start help or was it a bit complicated or was it not really necessary? 
Um, I'm trying to get the feedback form. Sorry, guys. One second. Oh, there we go. Hopefully that helped. Yeah. Um, fine. I hope you found it useful, guys. Um, yeah, I, I just thought it would help you understand the concept of what is the core in your life? What is actually the uvia? What is um, kind of anterior uvia? Why do you get a hypopian? Because hypopian, as you can see, doesn't only mean an infection. Um, guys, if, you're, if you want to follow me on Instagram, um, email me any questions there. I usually put on a lot of ophthalmological eye stuff kind of on my Instagram. So if you're interested, then message me on there. Um, and yeah, thanks for coming, guys. Hope you found it useful. Sorry we overran by a little bit, but um, yeah. Um, I'm glad most of you found it useful. I'll be around for a few minutes if you have any questions, but if not, yeah, you guys can head off. Have a good evening, guys, and obviously best of luck with all your exams. Oh, that's nice. Literally the best optile lecture ever. Any questions and just put them in the chat or something. Oh, there's one here. Wasn't discussed here, but just curious, is mild anosocoria without alarm? Yeah, not, nothing to worry about. And isochoria just means difference in the pupil size. So if it's just by itself, it could mean a few things. Obviously, you worry about things like third nerve palsy or horners, but a lot of people have physiological anisocoria, which is a small difference without any kind of reason for it. And honestly, guys, if you guys are interested in this kind of stuff, ophthalmology is a great career. Um, will I do another one for ophthalmology? Um, if you guys want to, I can. I think... Um, it really depends on what, what the bite medicine team um, really ask for. I kind of go along with them. Uh, yeah, we do give everything. We give intracameral antibiotics. We give antibiotics into the eye to prevent endophthalmitis, but just unfortunately it does happen. Um, it's really, really unfortunate when it does happen because it's obviously kind of an iatronic thing. Is a small cup disc ratio dangerous? No, nope. no, nope, absolutely fine. Some people have like a 0.2. Don't worry about that at all. But yeah, you guys all seem really keen. Honestly, I would strongly recommend ophthalmology. It's a great career. People don't learn about it enough at medical school, which is why I think it gets overlooked. Okay, so there's no more questions. Could you please repeat the orbital septum stuff? Yeah, sure. So basically, in, within the eyelid, you've got various parts, but one of them is the orbital septum, which is basically just a thick wall of fibrous tissue. And that forms around the age of seven or eight. So when you've got that, even if you get an infection from the sinus or from the eyelid, it doesn't usually cross the orbital septum. So usually these patients get a preceptal cellulitis. Whereas if you have a child that is quite weak, so it spreads into the eye and it can affect all of these parts. And that's causing orbital cellulitis. And it presents usually when it affects the optic nerve. Do you have any tips or tricks with Duke Elder? Yeah, I'm doing a course, I think, with the RSM. We're going to be in a one-day online course for free for you guys. We did it last year as well, where we go over past questions and things like that. So um, just check the RSM website or message me on Instagram or email me or something like that. And um, basically, I'll just use lecture notes in ophthalmology if you're sitting in sitting with Duke Elder. Uh, 